Welcome back to another episode of Out of Bounds on the Boom and Bust channel. I'm your host, Terry, and today we're going to talk about a couple things, starting off with the affirmative action uh, decision by the Supreme Court. So we're going to first uh, break this down into three parts. We're going to talk about the philosophy of it, the legality of it, and then we're going to talk about it from an equity lens. Um, to kick it off, first thing I'll mention that I, I mentioned online was that I had a professor and my program who's a law professor who mentioned uh back in 2020 when i started my phd she had mentioned that people aren't really understanding what's about to happen with the supreme court that we have a large majority conservative for the first time in a while and that there's potential and probably likelihood that a lot of big things are going to change because obviously the Supreme Court kind of sets the precedence for all other courts. So I did not I didn't necessarily understand what she meant. And I definitely didn't understand the whole judicial system as well as I do now. But I heard her, but I didn't think it would be like this. So this is something that many experts or people that understand the field saw was coming, but too many in the everyday people don't, they don't really understand it. And I include myself in that. Like we didn't understand like the importance of what that could actually mean. Now, if you look historically, that's just what it is. That's how the system is set up. Um, it's more than two sides, but we look at a conservative liberal and you, you try to get the power through these checks and balances. The president is one. Then you got the Supreme Court. You got the House. You know, you got the Senate. It's all so there's checks and balances built in so that hopefully no one just has unilateral power. But if you swing enough votes, this is what could happen. So we already saw with the Roe v. Wade and we discussed that when that happened. And now we got affirmative action. And to be honest, to me, um, affirmative action is less, way less of a shock than Roe v. Wade uh, for me personally. That's one where it is highly, uh, is, is in terms of affirmative action, excuse me, it's highly polarized. I mean, of course, Roe v. Wade and abortion is too on the basis of religion and right whatnot. But when you talk about affirmative action, there's so many proponents and detractors on both sides. Uh, you know, if you want to call it the black and white line, but just in general, people of color, non-people of color, all that, uh, liberal, conservative is everywhere. It's very polarizing. So that's not one that I thought would be such a shock that it would go down especially again we're talking about specifically admissions into higher education now that is smack dab in the middle of my expertise so there's a lot i can say about that but that one in particular is very polarizing now obviously people use this to try to parlay it to affirmative action in other areas but that's what we're specifically talking about so philosophically and i, I believe i've mentioned this before throughout the different episodes i had i made a definite change in my thought about it and it was actually due to the legal courses that i took in my program I was very much one of those people that did not believe in affirmative action. Uh, I was not too long ago, less than 10 years ago, somebody that was just like the affirmative action is counterproductive. And we see that we see that from, again, people of color who might buy into the colorblind narrative. We see that from actual racists who want to use that as a, uh, a disguise to hide their prejudice and their bias. But we hear that it's counterproductive. We are all equal. We don't need this extra, you know, incentive or extra boost or extra help for all these X, Y, Z people. And it sounds good. And again, that's something that I bought into it because I felt like, OK, well, if we continue to be categorized 
and receive things or not receive things based on our race, then we're just perpetuating the racist system that got us here in the first place where we were discriminated because of our race. And again, it sounds good. It sounds like it makes sense, but that is operating on an individual level. And my mind changed when I started to operate on a systematic level. So again, when we're talking about oppression, we're talking about racism, all that, these are systematic or these are systems of oppression. These are systems of power that make it possible because there's no one individual that is out here working hard to oppress somebody in a fair system it's just not going to happen even if it's 10 20 100 you know a thousand people it's just not going to happen what happens is the systems itself are corrupt and the systems itself are built to create oppression and you have individuals that contribute to it and can and let it continue so i say that to say um and maybe this parlays a little bit into the legality of it but for me i had to come to understand that the system is the thing that affects society and got us to a place where something like affirmative action is even necessary I mean, on its root, if you, I guess, if you just take it at complete, no context, face value, yes, it sounds good to say, well, we shouldn't judge you differently because you look different. We should all be judged the same. However, when you look at it in this actual context, which everybody in America of age knows, that's not the way, and that's not the history we operate in. We operate in a history and in a system that purposefully took something away from many people so that other people could benefit. And so that parlays to the legality part of it. Affirmative action was able to take place and it happens. And I'm not a legal expert. I'm just saying that. But it it happens because it's of significant interest to the state to the state and then effectively to the country what we look at or when we look at diversity and everything it's a significant interest that we rectify the issues of the past in order to again create some type of balance now was it a perfect system obviously not was it successful obviously not But when, again, you go to the courts and you go to the legal part of it as to why did we allow affirmative action in its various ways, including in higher education admissions, is because the the justice system recognizes in writing that the past of America has put certain people at a disadvantage. And not by happenstance, actively and purposefully, intentionally put certain people at a disadvantage. And so it is within the state's interest to rectify that by giving consideration to certain protected groups, which goes again into your other amendments and your rights. But also overall, again, it's just a recognition of what the truth is. And again, for me, I originally felt bad, a little weird about it, that, hey, I'm black. I don't need it pointed out that I'm black and get special treatment to get somewhere. But then you have to realize it ain't just about that. It's, again, trying to not necessarily reverse, but at least course correct the system that discriminated against you. And so that all comes into part, again, of the legal issues and for this i'm not really going to go deep into the explanation of the supreme court or you know uh what their legal opinions are because i i just don't think we need to but also i know that is nothing of significance it's no you know epiphany moment in there we know exactly what it is it's a conservative group 
placating to their base. And to be honest, I don't know if XYZ of these people on the right believe in everything they do, but I do know they believe in keeping their votes and they believe in trying to please their base so that they gain popularity. So whether they believe in it or not, they're going to do what's of interest to the pout. Now, what's inter interesting to me, and I think that, you know, again, I wouldn't be shocked by the system because that's always been the system. But I think what people should be shocked at is that when the system is operating at its best for influential, powerful people on the right, why is it that their number one agendas are to take away rights from people? So if they, you know, like I said, line it up, Supreme Court, House, Senate, all that, uh, or Congress and all that, and you line it up to where you have a majority power why is it that your top priorities are to take away people's rights that's the real question but anyway so there's that um i'm not going like i said i'm not going to dig into the specifics of it but at the heart of the legal argument is that it's a, it's a significant interest of the state to right the wrongs of the past and that's not far off from what it says it is very much acknowledged in writing that this the country has a history of systematic oppression and that is why affirmative action was allowed to thrive now we talk about the equity of it which kind of goes to the philosophy as well but we go to the equity of it Many people that, again, are really just hiding their racist agenda are standing behind this idea of, well, it should be fair. It shouldn't be something that you get off of a bias that makes it not as um, legit, not as qualified and all these uh, other different things. And that is taking seats from other qualified people. Now, there's a lot of argument to that. Again, I happen to agree with the central heart of it that this is a measure made by the system to counter a measure made by the system in the past. The system having the work to fix itself. And again, some people don't believe a broken system can fix itself. Some people do. But again, for me personally, I tend to agree with this idea that, OK, you could call it. I mean, yeah, bias, discrimination, you call it all that. And some people are scared to. But why are we scared to call it that when that's exactly what it was in the past? It was bias, discrimination and racism against us. So why is it, why am I scared to say is bias and discrimination for us now? Now, the difference is that this is made to bring in people who are qualified that because of the system would not otherwise get consideration. Of course, the number one thing that people who are racist and against it are going to say is this is designed to bring in unqualified people to replace qualified people. And that's not the spirit of it that's not what it is so then you have people who say um i forgot the lady's name but the one girl that brought up the lawsuit in texas against the university of texas is that i am qualified and the only reason i didn't get it is because i'm white now there is a legitimate discussion and debate there that part i will not deny uh, because there's a number of times that I've seen this discussion pop up among students and everything else when we're talking about quotas and just putting people in because they're quote unquote diverse. Now, obviously, throughout the many decisions in the past, the court has said there's a correct way to do this that isn't overly discriminating and that isn't overtly 
like we said, bringing in unqualified people over qualified people. What we would like to think is that if you're setting up a program in the way that it's supposed to be, that two people who are qualified, but one as to the diversity of the pool, that is the one advantage they'll have. Not the not that okay this score is super low this gpa is super low this person doesn't have a good resume this person doesn't have anything blah 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 but we're just going to take them anyway that's not the intent of it and that's not what is supposed to uh work now obviously you're talking about an entire country does affirmative action work perfectly everywhere no depends on the people uh putting it out there but that is the nature and the spirit of it and so you get to discussions about legacies, about uh, Ivy League schools where they're allowed to consider, hey, your parents were alumni or someone in the family was alumni or they're a donor or whatever. And that is going to boost your likelihood of getting in. And then, of course, we know athletes that boost your likelihood of getting in. But then we got people who aren't even actual athletes. That's just the way they got in and blah, blah, blah. Like the college admission scandal that came out, that's just a small tip of the iceberg. But that's what we're putting it up against because you're going to have people saying that affirmative action is discriminatory, it's racist, all this stuff. But then you have to look at the other parts of it too and say, wait a minute, there's a whole lot of people who are actually unqualified getting in just because of who they are and what they look like and again that goes back to the systematic oppression of it all and that's when that's why i say if we look at it from an equity lens i acknowledge there are real debates about it but when it's finite and it's zero sum you got to have considerations and things can get tough and sticky. And so I personally think if that's what it comes down to, you know, a minority status and adding to the diversity and everything, I don't have a problem with that, to be honest with you. I really don't. Because if it's a significant interest to you, as it was to the state up until now, then that's something that you want to consider in your admission process. And that's something you want to consider in your recruitment in any other area. And the reason you have to do that is because of the long history of the exclusion of people of color. So this idea that we just get to ignore the history and blame the system right now and say oh well you can't do that because it's not fair well if you want to talk about fair let's talk about the history of the country and again so that was the turning point for me because i very much would have been one of those people that felt that way hey this isn't fair like why are we even considering this but then you have to move from the individual and go to the system looking at the individual is part of colorblind racism that's one of the stronger staples of it this idea of meritocracy oh you didn't make it because you couldn't do it because you don't have it i made it to harvard because i have it did you or did you make it because of your daddy or your mama or your grandfather is not the truth for everybody and so the same way that's not the truth for every harvard person that makes it it's not true for every person of color that doesn't make it that oh you didn't make it just because you couldn't make it maybe they didn't make it because of how the system set up against them so the thing is it's never going to be 100 percent. like i said it's going to be cases for every side and the way unfortunately the legal system works is you find one case that fits the narrative and then people run with their agenda so for me when you talk about philosophically i i have switched and I understand people that are on the other side. But again, I think, at least for me, that was the result of my ignorance of what's actually happening around me. 
you talk about the legal side and again without looking at the supreme court's declaration and opinions because at the end of the day i think it's just politics of why they chose to do it but historically affirmative action was the direct result of the justice system recognizing systematic oppression and then equity wise i do think it holds up i do think there are some sticky discussions that are going to happen because of it but i think ultimately it holds up because of what the court said this is a blatant attempt to reverse a blatant attempt to oppress and i think that's i think that's fair so um as far as the impact you know looking forward there you know it's hard to say you have so many different programs across so many different schools the school i work at they've already put out statements it's not going to impact us and the truth is it won't but the the counter to it is that it won't impact us because we don't consider race we have a holistic process and we consider xyz and yes you do but my institution creates another form of racism which is the systematic oppression by socioeconomics and to be honest the the, the research has shown that test optional and test blind and all these things they still produce the same segregated results now that's having a deeper discussion because now we're just talking about high schoolers applying to college but as i said many times before the deeper discussion goes into what's happening in those high schools what's happening in those elementary schools before high school depending on what neighborhood you're in different things are happening and that's a deeper discussion so but in terms of just emissions policy i think that is perfectly fine um and having it being take away taken away you can't necessarily give the complete scope of the impact but it will definitely hurt some individuals i mean the number, you know, when students turn to numbers, numbers can mean a lot. You say, oh, we only got 20 students that benefited from this. Well, if you talk to 20 people for 20 night, one person for 20 nights straight, those 20 people, it, it significantly impacts you emotionally, mentally, physically. But when you're just reading numbers, it's easy to just write that off. Oh, well, if we do this, we could do 500, blah, blah, blah. This only helps 20 people. Or we we'll only lose 20 people in this program who wouldn't have made it with this new law. Well, those each of those 20 are actual people, and you don't know what they could have done. And some people say you don't know who the other person who lost down the spot could have done. But at the end of the day, I think higher education is way wide enough for people to find those seats. And again, it's not perfect. And I'm not saying it is. It's going to be sticky situations. But yeah, that's just kind of where I fall on. it. All right. To wrap it up, I'm going to talk about Roseanne Barr. She has some comments about the Holocaust and everything. And I'll make it clear right now. If it wasn't clear before. The conversation about between Jewish and black people is very real and is very much kept under wraps um, for a number of different reasons. And I do not feel this over. I would say very similar to what happened with the Stop Asian Hate. I don't feel this overwhelming need to support and all that not rooting for anybody to get hurt not rooting for anybody to be discriminated against but i don't feel this overwhelming need to lay down myself on the line for the, these causes because absent in all of that is a very real discussion about the uh interrelationships between those two groups of people so why i feel about the the asian community at large same way i feel about the jewish community at large so i'm put that out there but even with that aside 
my feelings about Roseanne Barr is that it is being overblown in my personal opinion what I understand is that we are in a place of political correctness where the idea of comedy is very tricky and I've talked about this several times as well the idea of comedy is very tricky when you're talking about being politically correct because comedy is subjective art is subjective now music does not receive as much scrutiny but it does beyonce changed the word here some people have changed some lyrics we have people going back retroactively to point out songs back in the day like hey this is problematic but it's not on as large of scale as a comedian i don't believe now why that is i don't know but I will say that when it comes to comedy, and, and it's a pure fact because I'm a big fan of comedy, different comedians and all that, the art of comedy, not just, you know, laughing. And I have not heard any comedian say, yeah, I just kind of continue as business as usual. No, every comedian I've heard since probably, what, 2018, 2019, they have said they had to consider what material they do now that doesn't mean they don't take risks but it has to be more calculated because they know that you can get quote unquote canceled and that could really hurt your opportunities now tiffany haddish is coming up with a movie haunted mansion and we'll see what she does with that from the looks of it to me this movie was shot a while ago i'm not sure but she's been pretty much canceled because of something that she did in the past uh, a sketch that she did that people found untasteful and she was on a very hot role in her career so if you think that she put everything on hold and only was doing haunted mansion you sadly mistaken she lost out on career opportunities because she was quote unquote canceled so you you know i've talked about cancel culture and all that before i don't believe it's real that someone can quote unquote cancel you but public perception can absolutely affect what business opportunities you have again she's in a movie by disney so she's not canceled but it did impact her work so I say that to say that comedians in effect of public or um, political correctness is very real. And also, I should say, I don't have a problem with political correctness there. And that, again, is subjective. There is definitely a line that I think is appropriate. But political correctness as in and of itself, I don't think is the issue. I don't think, oh, I should be a free for all, say whatever I want. You're you're soft if you don't uh, or if you're offended by it. No, I don't agree with that. But I do think there's a limit to it. And so when you're talking about being offended, what you know, there's it's, it's impossible to draw a line because everybody's different. So comedy has been affected for years over this. We now get to Roseanne Barr. The thing is, I don't defend nothing she said in the past and blah, blah, I was on drugs and all. I don't care. But what I will say is in this particular incident, we are compartmentalizing. She was very, very, very clearly being sarcastic and joking. She was not being literal. And the problem I have is that the media and everybody, of course, is spending it as if she literally said this. And because of her past, she does not have the benefit of the doubt. And I talked about that before, too, because essentially that's all that we talk about when you're talking about being canceled and everything is the benefit of the doubt. She has no benefit of the doubt. So if I just saw the, the, the articles, which are everywhere, Roseanne Barr said that the Holocaust didn't happen. The average person who doesn't agree with her will be like, oh, I'm not shocked. Yeah, she she probably did say that without looking further into it. But if you actually watch the clip or even listen to the clip, the full interview, you know, there is no doubt she was joking. It, 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 it was joking. Like if I said, man, I was late to work. 
when I got to work, I ripped my pants. I tried to fix my pants and got my shoe stuck in the toilet. And somebody's like, dang, your life sucks. You should just kill yourself. And I was like, yeah, man, I should just kill myself. It's over with. It can't get no worse than this. It's a, it's sarcasm. You know I'm not, I'm not serious. Now, if you just clipped it and said, Terry said I should kill myself. Oh, Terry suicidal. Oh, my God. Like, you could make it into a narrative. But when you look at the full context, it's very clear what she was saying. Now, what I will not argue against is people who will say that's not OK. I don't care if you was joking. I don't care if you were sarcastic. Those words should not be said. I personally don't agree with that, but I will not argue against somebody because, again, sensitivity and being offense or not sensitivity, but being offended by something is subjective. There's plenty of things that I know that are near and dear to me. That if somebody said, even jokingly, I would still take a certain way. If there was, I wouldn't even say a random person. Let's say Donald Trump. If Donald Trump is talking and they're like, man, you, you, you know, your president, your president run or term was pretty rough. A lot of black people didn't like you. Like, it probably would have been easier if they weren't around. Yeah, you're right, man. They really didn't like me. It'd be way easier if I got rid of all these black people. Ha, ha, ha. Like, I, I would say same thing. He's clearly joking. He's clearly being sarcastic. But I would still be a little offended if Donald Trump said that. So, again, benefit of the doubt and different levels of being offended. So, I'm not going to push back against anybody that says Roseanne saying that even jokingly is a problem. That's your opinion. Cool. I don't agree with that, but I get it. What I do have a problem with and what I will defend is this idea that we could keep taking things out of context and going with it as fact. You have to look at the context. It's the same thing with microaggressions and the discussion about that. Your intention doesn't matter. It offended me. Two things can be true at once. Yes, it offended you, but it also matters that that is not the way I intended saying that at all. That doesn't make me right. That doesn't make you any less offended, but you can't just erase my part in this situation because you're offended. Because if we do that, then as I said before, where's the line? You can say it's a sunny day. I hate sunny days. My dad was killed on a sunny day. That's offensive to me. Like, no, we can't do that. So for me, again, what she said was clearly a joke being sarcastic. But people being offended about it, by it is legit. And I support that. But I will not support taking things out of context and just trying to paint a narrative about Roseanne. Let's have the actual conversation about Roseanne and I'm not a Roseanne fan I never even watched the show the stuff she said before about Trump stuff was it, it was it was gross I'm not really trying to defend her as a person but again compartmentalizing this this situation in the concept of the discussion I, I can't fully support how some people are treating it so that is it for me Go down comment section. Let me know what you think. Share it around. Get the conversation started. Thumbs up. Subscribe. And thank you for going out of bounds.